Good morning and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the 10th Amendment Center and this is the Fast Friday edition of the show for November 11th, 2022. And since I've been off for a few days here, I want to get right to it. And yesterday was a really important day in history that, of course, no one really teaches about in school. So even though I've done a bunch of other episodes on it, I've got to do another over and over and over again. So we're talking about November 10th, 1798. That's when the Kentucky House passed resolutions drafted by Thomas Jefferson in response to the hated Alien and Sedition Acts of that year. And these resolutions, you can see permeating throughout them that they were based on three essential principles of the American Revolution. But let's get right to it. Here's an article by Mike Meharry, and he says, During the summer of that year in 1798, Congress passed and President John Adams signed into law four acts together known as the Alien and Sedition Acts. With winds of war blowing across the Atlantic, the Federalist Party majority wrote laws to prevent what they were calling seditious acts from weakening the U.S. government. Now, this is really interesting here because it was signed by Adams. Mike points out that Federalists utilized fear of the French to stir up support. And back when John Adams was one of the good guys back in 1776, when he was known as the Atlas of Independence, for example, he pointed out that fear is the foundation of most governments. Fear is how we just remove the word most, of course. But here they are using fear of the French, fear of a foreign danger to stir up support, Mike writes, for these draconian laws, expanding federal power, centralizing authority or concentrating authority in the executive branch and severely restricting freedom of speech. Just years out of the box, out of the gates. And this is a very aggressive uh, attack on the Constitution and liberty. Now here, in the weeks leading up to passage of these acts, James Madison made a really great observation in a letter to Thomas Jefferson. This is May of 1798, May 13th. And he said, perhaps it is a universal truth that the loss of liberty at home is to be charged against provisions against danger, real or pretended, from abroad. Now, back to Meharry, he said two of the alien acts, this is a quick overview. Of course, I will link to this in the show notes. I'll get to that in just a moment. Two of the alien acts gave the president the power to declare foreign U.S. residents an enemy, lock them up and deport them. These acts vested judicial authority in the executive branch and obliterated due process. The Sedition Act, Mike points out, essentially outlawed criticizing the federal government. In essence, anyone working for the federal government minus the sitting vice president, you couldn't bring them into ill repute. This, Mike points out, was a clear violation of the First Amendment. Now, the sitting vice president... Actually, there were a number of counties before getting to that. There were a number of counties in the Commonwealth of Kentucky that adopted resolutions pretty quickly condemning the acts. And Mike notes that a Madison County, Kentucky militia regiment also issued an ominous resolution of its own stating, quote, the alien and sedition bills are an infringement of the Constitution and of natural rights, and that we cannot approve or submit to them. And since we're talking about how the principles of the resolution of the American Revolution permeate the resolutions of 1798, think about the idea of natural rights being cited so prominently here, where natural rights was such an important part of the American revolutionary thought. And then, of course, we cannot approve or submit to them. You only need to go back to the Declaration and Resolves of the First Continental Congress in 1774, where they had issued uh, this long declaration stating that a bunch of things that Parliament had done, and then they said, to these grievous acts, Americans cannot submit. So the mentality that if you do things you're not authorized to do in government, the people cannot and will not submit to them. Mike goes on, he says, several thousand people gathered at an outdoor meeting protesting the acts in Lexington on August 13th. Now, to the city vice president, Thomas Jefferson, he penned his initial draft of resolutions that he shopped around uh, to see if someone could get them introduced. He thought maybe Virginia, but they were passed along to John Breckinridge, who uh, introduced a modified version of them in Kentucky. 
And he uh, drafted something in response to this within a month or so of passage. And he starts out with this, and this is from the final version passed in the House of Representatives in Kentucky, November 10th, 1798. One, resolved that the several states composing the United States of America are not united on the principle of unlimited submission to their general government. The idea that there was a union of sovereign states, free and independent states, that they came together for certain limited delegated purposes under the Constitution, they weren't recreating the British system where the British Parliament was totally supreme, had final authority and all sovereignty. Jefferson goes on. He said they constituted a general government for special purposes, delegated to that government certain definite powers, reserving each state to itself the residuary mass of right to their own self-government. Now, Jefferson, some years earlier in 1791, in response to Alexander Hamilton's bank bill, he specifically said that he considered the foundation of the Constitution to be on the grounds that w- of what became the Tenth Amendment, delegated and reserved powers. Now, this part here, right off the bat, like so much else in these Kentucky resolutions of 1798, they go right back to the principles of the American Revolution, as I keep saying. The founders, the old revolutionaries, They understood that a government without limits, what they called an arbitrary government, was the very definition of a tyranny. An arbitrary government specifically was also expressly included as one of the grievances in the Declaration of Independence. I covered this in an episode in June of this year in 2022, Arbitrary Government, How the Founders Defined Tyranny. Anyway, back to Jefferson, he continued with this statement. Whensoever the general government assumes undelegated powers, its acts are unauthoritative, void, and of no force. And especially when we're thinking about that word void and acts outside of the Constitution, this goes all the way to the beginning of the American Revolution. What John Adams at one point he called a radical, the real American revolution to Adams wasn't the war for independence. It was a radical change in the viewpoints of the people. And that started in 1761 with James Otis Jr.'s long and powerful speech against the writs of assistance. And here, among many other things, Otis said an act against the Constitution is void. Now, of course, he was talking about the unwritten Constitution for the British. But it doesn't matter if you have written or unwritten. The idea is the same. If the government is given rules and then the government goes beyond the rules that the people have given to it, those acts are void. And Otis in 1761 and Jefferson in 1798 use that exact same word. And this really was a shift for the people. This was a big part of that radical change in the viewpoint of the people, the real American revolution in how they viewed sovereignty or final authority. Because if government held sovereignty or if a king or a queen held sovereignty or if parliament or Congress holds sovereignty or final authority over itself, then they can tell the people whether or not an act against the constitution is void. But because They are just agents of the sovereign people of the several states, the government, that is, at least under the Constitution, then it's not up to them to make that decision. Now, this was also a very important principle during the ratification debates. You saw people like Oliver Ellsworth, Roger Sherman, even Alexander Hamilton said very similar things. Basically, if the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, then violations of the Constitution are void whether the government agrees with that or not. So I covered this concept also in another episode, an act against the Constitution is void, April 11th, 2022. And I should mention, since I keep mentioning articles and original source documents and Jefferson and an article by Meharry and these other episodes, I will include all of these in a blog post. I publish a blog post for each episode about one to two hours after the live stream is done. So in a couple hours here today, Uh, but you can find all the episodes and sections for each one with all the links that I'm mentioning. This is a mouthful over at our show homepage, 10th amendment center.com slash path to Liberty. It's all spelled out 10th amendment center.com slash path to Liberty. Anyway, back to Jefferson. He goes on with this. 
the government created by this compact. So he's talking about the government created by the compact, the Constitution for the United States. The government created by this compact was not made the exclusive or final judge of the extent of the powers delegated to itself. Since that would have made its discretion and not the Constitution the measure of its powers. Again, he's asserting that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And, well, this should be obvious. If the people are sovereign, then the government created by those people cannot be a higher authority than the people themselves or the Constitution that the people are using to delegate powers to an agent, that is, the government. Here's George Mason emphasizing this important principle of the revolution in 1775. All power was originally lodged in and consequently is derived from the people. The, again, the people are the top of the food chain, or at least they're supposed to be. It's time for them to act like it, right? James Wilson reminded us of this same principle during the ratification debates. He said, the truth is that in our governments, the supreme, absolute, and uncontrollable power remains in the people. And I emphasized, if you're watching the video here, you can see the meme or the image that we created for this quote. We emphasized the word remains because I think that's really an important part of this. Wilson used the word remains and he was a very, very good legal mind. And he's reiterating the fact that the people have always held supreme final authority, sovereignty in the American system. And it wasn't something that was going to be brand new. It was just reiterating this idea of delegated and reserved powers, reiterates the notion that the people have created the government and it's not the other way around. Or in the American system, the people of the several states. Now, of course, the ultimate question then is, um, for Jefferson as well, what do we do about it? And here in his original draft, he put it this way. In cases of an abuse, in cases of an abuse of the delegated powers, the members of the general government being chosen by the people, a change by the people would be the constitutional remedy. Now that's Jeffersonian flair for saying, well, when they violate they violate your trust by doing really bad policy, but they're not violating the Constitution itself. You change the people. It's the vote the bums out strategy. That's when you use that. But, and here's the big but, where powers are assumed which have not been delegated, a nullification of the act is the rightful remedy. So choosing new bums is your approach where they're within the bounds of the Constitution, but you don't like how they're doing stuff. Like they're authorized to do certain regulations or whatever it may be. They're authorized to declare war. Congress has delegated the power to declare war. You don't like the fact that they declared war on somebody. Then you throw them out and you find somebody else. That's what Jefferson is saying. But as soon as they go beyond the limits of the Constitution, where powers are assumed which have not been delegated, a nullification of the act is the rightful remedy. And there's a lot to unpack there, but very quickly, again, not later on, not after you've tried a bunch of other things, not four or six years down the line, but as soon as they violate the Constitution, you're supposed to resist them. And it is the rightful remedy, not just a mere good idea. And he points out that every state has a natural right in cases not within the compact to nullify of their own authority all assumptions of power by others within their limits. And he's basically saying, like, look, it is a natural right of the people of each state to make a determination of whether or not they feel that the general government, the federal government, has gone beyond its limits and is violating their rights. And it doesn't matter if any other state agrees with them, they have this authority on their own to nullify of their own authority all assumptions of power by others within their limits. And he says, without this right, they would be under the dominion, absolute and unlimited, of whosoever might exercise this right of judgment for them. Now, that didn't make it into the final version in 1798 passed by the Kentucky House. But as Mike Meharry noted in his article, 
the impact was actually the same and Jefferson was actually totally fine with the result. And they did a follow-up resolution in 1799 that did include this nullification language specifically. Now from here, Jefferson went into some detail about the constitutionality of the various acts, describing them and explaining their problems under the constitution in some detail. But then he closed with this juicy foundational principle from the American revolution. And I'm sure he knew what he was doing. I think for those of you who are regulars to this show, you're going to recognize some of this. Well, there's going to be one key phrase that I'll get to in just a moment. And he's talking here about calling for other states to join in and supporting Kentucky in this resolution, just like John Dickinson recommended in response to the Townsend Acts of 1767. So this is a very well understood process. And he calls on these other states and he says he hopes that they will view this as or he's confident they're going to view this as seizing the rights of the states. Now, they use the term rights and power very interchangeably here. Now, of course, we have individual rights and only people, individuals have rights, but then they also said the right of action. So this would be in this situation, seizing the power of the states and consolidating them in the hands of the general government with a power assumed to bind the states, not merely in cases made federal. So not just under the powers delegated in the federal constitution, but in all cases whatsoever. And that's the key phrase, not just to bind the states and the people of the states, where the powers have been delegated in the Constitution, but instead in all cases whatsoever, by laws made not with their consent, but by others against their consent. That this would be to surrender the form of government we have chosen and to live under one deriving its powers from its own will and not from our own authority. Now, again, for those of you who are regulars here, you're definitely familiar with the phrase, in all cases whatsoever. This comes specifically from the Declaratory Act of 1766. I forget the exact date. It was passed immediately. I think it was actually the same day they repealed the Stamp Act in 1766. And at the same time, they passed the Declaratory Act where Parliament claimed the power over the colonies, quote, in all cases whatsoever. This specific phrase was cited by revolutionary after revolutionary. John Hancock in his massacre, Boston Massacre Day Oration said, you know, this is the underlying problem. We're talking about uh, taxation without representation. This is just an outgrowth of their claiming the power over us in all cases whatsoever. It was cited by Thomas Paine in the American crisis in the <laughs> harsh winter of December 1776 saying you can't give up now. It doesn't matter how difficult it is. You can't give up now because as long as they claim power over us in all cases whatsoever, we will never be free. And it was also included, of course, expressly in the Declaration of Independence as well. And I did an episode on that essential principle. Uh, back in March of 2021, unlimited centralized power in all cases whatsoever. Of course, that will be linked to in the show notes once I publish that blog post over at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. Now, for Thomas Jefferson in 1798 and for the old revolutionaries going all the way back to 1761, I think we have three main principles that we can see here in the Kentucky resolutions of 1798. And that's, first of all, it's the people, the people of the several states who hold sovereignty or final authority and not the government. So the people have sovereignty, not the government. Two, when government goes beyond the limits that the people have given to them, those acts are void no matter what the government has to say about it. And three, ultimately, and this is probably the most important part of this, it's up to the people to treat them that way, too. They have to look at them as void and act as if they are void, whether the government wants them to or not. In short, it's resist, refuse to comply, and nullify. 
Now, this is an incredibly important message that we work really hard to get out to more and more people every single day. There's absolutely nothing that helps us get that job done more than the financial faith and support of our members. You can join us for as little as two bucks a month over at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash members. Again, 10th Amendment Center dot com slash members. I'd be very grateful for any support you can give us today, but don't feel obligated. We will take whatever you've got or some support in some free and easy peasy ways like smashing the like button, leaving reviews on Apple Podcasts, subscribing, getting notifications, all those things that trigger algorithms of these big platforms. And I am really sorry that I haven't been available for the last couple of episodes. I had to take some time off for a family emergency and sadly a funeral, but I'm really glad to be back here today. And I will be back on my regular schedule next week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. So I hope you learned something on this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you have an awesome weekend and I'll see you next week here on the path to liberty.